So um, my name is Mark Stout, currently work for T-Mobile, previously with Sprint. And we're gonna cover the main protocols other than TCP that's used in LTE. Um, this is just a diagram of what the EPC and RAN is made up of in LTE. We're gonna concentrate on the highlighted portion. This is typically what I work on here, ME, S gateway, P gateway, and these interfaces that ingress and egress those particular nodes. Showing here the protocol that is used on the particular interfaces, the S interfaces or the GX interface. Um, those four particular protocols that we'll cover are SCTP, diameter, GDP version one and version two, S1 AP. Okay. First protocol I'm covering is SCTP, Stream Control Transmission Protocol, outlined RFC here. Um, on layer four, we got UDP, TCP, and this is the other. So not datagrams nor segments. SCTP uses what's called chunks. Chunks is what's used to pass the information, whether it be user data or control data for SCTP itself. Multiple chunks can be bundled together onto one SCTP packet up into the MTU size. That is, except for the control packets used to set up the session or tear down the session. You have um, <clears throat> sender and receiver in SCTP terms that would be endpoints. SCTP can also stand up multi-home host. So a single sender can send to the server and the server can then logically stand up to um, clients, that's a multi-hone host, what we use for our ENOBs, so that we have a backup path. And SCTP, is, we call it a stream, that's to find the logical channel for transporting the messages. So much like a TCP stream, it's SCTP stream. This outlines the part of the, SCTP header, it's not much to it. Source port, destination port, tag, checksum, everything you would expect to be in a header outside the data. So an association or a stream is established using a four-way handshake whereas TCP uses three-way, the SCTP is one better, so four-way handshake, and the shutdown process is a three-way handshake. So we'll cover each of those messages. I'll just line it out here. So the init and gets sent, in our example, we have an ENO B, which is host A, and the MME in the previous diagram will be host B. So the NOB sends the init, the ME would send back the init ACK, and that init ACK would have a, a cookie, and the NOB would echo that back to the ME to for verification, and then ACK that back, and now they associate us here in the store stood up. This is what the init tag looks like. <clears throat> we have a receive window, much like TCP. So that congestion is controlled kind of the same way. Uh, instead of sequence numbers, we use TSNs and verification tags. So that's what an act. So this is the second message in standing up the stream. This is where the MME would define the number of outbound streams. So if we want to stand up a second path, the MME could define that at that point, send it back, and a second stream could then be established. Okay. 
At that point, the NOB uh, receives the cookie information within the init ACK. It echoes, simply echoes that back to the ME for validation, and the ME would act that back. At that point, the stream is stood up. As we carry on into transmission of the actual data, whether it be um, user plane or just you know, B communications, um, we go through like a sequence and act, act sequence, much like TCP, but every ACK in SCTP is called a, a SAC or selective acknowledgement. Uh, the selective acknowledgement will carry all the TCN numbers that will be received at that point in time. That is, if the sender sent um, TSN one, two, three, the selective acknowledgement would send back three, and that would be the cumulative act of one, two, and three. So indicating that all the data has been successfully received. Um, then we have a section that's gap blocks. Within the acknowledgement, the receiver can say, I received TSN one, and then stand up a gap block and put three in that gap block. That would mean that the sender, to the, send, to the sender that it did not receive, the receiver did not receive TSN two. So much like selective acknowledgements on TCP, whether you have, where you have the ACK, and then you have the SACs on the back end, SCTP uses a selective acknowledgement for the overall ACK, and then gap blocks to identify where the gaps have occurred. I'll cover that here more here in a minute. Path monitoring, it's very important. That's how we know that our cell sites, our ENOBs are reachable. So we have heartbeats that are sent every so often, and those are ACT. So if over a period of time, let's say the MME hasn't got three heartbeats from the ENOB, <clears throat> the MME can tear that path down, reuse a backup path, or just ignore it overall so handoffs aren't, aren't screwed up at that point. Same goes for the ACK. So if the you know, B is sending the heartbeat, fails to get the ACK, in this example, let's say three times, the you know, B will tear it down. So um, that's just saying that the ME or the, well, at the time of teardown, it will be marked inactive. Uh, it can come back and be reused. Most of the time, it just comes back with an init and so on. So this is where the cumulative ACK is. You have a continued RWIN that is updated, and your gap blocks start. And you can have multiple gap blocks. This is the way Wireshark looks when you look at SCTP. I'm specifically outlining the SAC here, but so we have the cumulative TSN of, sorry. We're cumulative TSN of 91, let's say an example of 591. Then we have some gap block acknowledgements down here of 595 and through 597. So this means the receiver has received up to 591 and then also received 595, 596, and 597. So in this acknowledgement, we know that there was packet loss going from the sender to the receiver, and the receiver failed to get 592, 593, and 594. This isn't really outlined much in Wireshark, much, you know, you have a lot of tools for TCP. And you have, you know, built in color codes, things like that. So one of the things I do is just to build a filter for gap blocks, build a column for gap blocks, and then also build a color rule. So as soon as I see gap blocks, I color it much like I do a, a TCP retransmission or do back, just so I know that there is a problem happening at that point in time.
after the S1 init happens and SDTP stood up, that's much like DCP since NAC ACK. Now we have to get the uh, ENOB to actual peer to the enemy. This is the control part of, of the. So after SCTP is established, let's so we see an init, init act. Da, 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 da. Now the ENOB will send a setup as uh, one setup request. Um, it's kind of a bit out of order, but what it what this does is at this point the ENOB is able to inform the MME what it is, the ENOB name, uh, tracking areas to support, what kind of uh, cycle it supports, so on and so on. So yes, the init stands up the stream, but then you have to have the ENOB peer to the MME. Okay. Um, this is kind of going over the, like I talked about before, the columns I set up, the color rules, and so on and so on. So I know, you know, SCTP cap acts at this point, my eyes go directly to there. Um, so I know that there's three gaps here. So it is acknowledging uh, in order for some reason, 595, 596, just like before. So now I know that something happened, something happened up here. That is about it for SCTP. If you have any questions you want to ask now, we can do it now or go over it later. Okay. Next protocol I'm covering is diameter. Uh, diameter is the evolution of radius. Um, doesn't mean anything particular except that um, they thought what's twice as good as radius is diameter. So. The RFC is outlined here. These are the inter, um, equipment that we communicate diameter on. So at this point, it's just PCRF, HSS. There's been a couple more added within the specs, uh, but these are the only two we're really going to cover. When we talk about diameter, <clears throat> when it's first, first stood up, it's a peering state machine. Kind of like if you're familiar with BGP, there's a state machine there. It just outlines if you happen to catch the state in the time of turn up, these are different states you'll see and how it maps to what's going on. Like if, uh, TCP, if you're using TCP as layer four, you'll see SYNAC, SYN, SYNAC, ACK, and that will equate to your send connection request, wait connection and receive connection ACK. Okay. When all this is out of the way, then you go into diameter exchange. This is when the client will send its capabilities to the server and the server will acknowledge which capabilities it's able to do and if there's any other ones that need to be exchanged. Another thing I don't think I have in this is that we can also use SCTP as an underlying layer four protocol. So it doesn't necessarily have to be on TCP. So diameter headers start with the same 20 bits up here. And then after that is what we call AVPs, attribute value pairs, are then used to exchange your messages. So like we talked about CER, CEA, if the application ID was 225, Wireshark knows to map that to a capability exchange request. So this is all the dissector is doing underneath is mapping this code to a readable, readable message. So you don't have to remember 282 equals disconnect peer or so on and so on. Also within the application IDs, um, that's what you know which interface you're gonna be on. So like before, I wanna show the diagram of GX, S6A, so on and so on. That particular 
interface will map to an application ID. So if the MME on S6A is trying to talk to a PCRF, they'll know in the capability exchange that this application ID doesn't match GX. So that will not be allowed. But if you don't know what type of interface it is, you can always look at this application ID and know that it's S6A, GX, and so on and so on. And the Wireshark dissector will do that in the background as well, convert this number to a human, human readable, so, or human rememberable anyway. So before all data is delivered in forms of AVP, AVPs, attribute value pairs. Some of these values are used for the diameter protocol self, while others deliver data associated with the particular application. So if you were trying to deliver the number of octets a subscriber used, that would be the data associated. If you have an AVP that's for the server, um, let's say server type, it could be used under the protocol itself. That's all this is outlined. Capabilities no negotiation, we talked about that with the CER, CEA. And I think one thing to remember is with diameter, every time you hear R at the end, usually means request. And time you hear A at the end, usually means answer. So Whenever you send a request, you want to see an answer. I think I outlined in before that you may see the request, and then TCP underneath it will act it, but that doesn't mean you're actually going to get an answer. So one thing I try to remember to do is don't just filter for diameter. Filter on the stream itself, because if you just filtered on the diameter, you would miss this act entirely. And that's kind of important when you're saying, I sent a request, but didn't get an answer. Because if you sent a request, got an act, but didn't get an answer, well, then you probably shouldn't be looking at the path, right? But if you could send a request, didn't get an act, didn't get an answer, then you're looking at a path. Kind of helps with troubleshooting there. Okay, hey, Mark, you have a question on the Q&A. Question. So diameter interface is only with the MME. No. Um, so up here, diameter is MME to HSS, and then for MME to connect to S gateway and our P gateway, that's GDP C, and then from the P gateway, you, know, you have diameter to the PCRF, you have diameter to the AAA. You have diameter to your OCS, and so on and so on. I'm just outlining these particular ones here. Okay. Hope that answered that. The other thing. Um, I wanted to highlight is that AVPs are typically in ASCII format. So I use that to my advantage a lot because I don't necessarily need to go digging through the AVPs because there could be a lot here. Simply open up my bits view, ASCII view, make sure you're looking at this in ASCII and click on Let's say I'm looking for PCRF, I'm looking for a diameter host. I just want to know what the diameter host is. Um, I can simply see it there. When I click on it, Wireshark highlights the, the uh, bits that are applicable and then actually opens the AVP that is applicable. So I find that very quick and I don't even have to worry about opening. I just look, do that. Um, let's say I have a litany of packets here, and I know that I'm just looking for um, diameter host to a particular um, OCS or, or AAA. I don't need to know the AVP name or anything like that. I just need to know a little bit of that diameter host name. And I'll come up here and I'll use the filter frame contains. 
PCRF. And that will open all the pa uh, filter out all the packets that only have PCRF in, in ASCII. So then I can simply click on that and filter by, by stream. The other thing is if you're passing uh, user information, much like your, your MDN, MZ, which would be also your device number, you can just simply type that up, up here as well. Frame contains and then type in the device number. That'll get you directly to a part of the stream and then you start filtering from there. AVPs themselves are grouped into parent-child relationship. This relationship is set up in the XML files of Wireshark in the diameter directory. Um, what I'm trying to highlight here is that there's a lot of good info and this is where the human readable or human rememberable factor comes in. So yeah, code 2001 equals diameter success. You can go into this uh, XML file and change this to something else. So now, instead of saying diameter success in your Wireshark output uh, over here, it, it can say whatever you want. These are typically taken from the 3GPP standards verbatim. So in the comments of most of these, you'll find which 3GPP standards they refer to when uh, making these groupings, making these namings, and so on. That's nice when you have a question about, well, I haven't seen this before. What is this diameter loop detected or whatever it may be? Um, if you go look in this XML file, you'll see that it's referred to a particular RFC. You just go look up that RFC and find out what, what's applicable about it. The other thing is that this is where you set up your parent-child relations. So you may have, uh, let's say in this example, we have a charging rule definition. Um, you may wonder well, what's all the options underneath charging rule definition? Because we typically only see, let's say rule name, um, online, offline, QoS information, things like that. But there's a lot of other things that may be applicable. Um, this is where that parent-child relationship is made. So you create an AVP, then you create the group, and you stack all the AVPs, all the children AVPs underneath that parent. So Diamond has multiple request and answer types. They can be different based on the AVP that you're passing or wanting to see. Um, I'm trying to define here, say, don't create multiple columns for that. To me, when I see diameter username or diameter subscription ID, that's just the device or the handset's number, okay? So they may be the same value, but they're different in the dissector point of view. So what I do is I create a custom column give it something, I, like in this case, I say username, so something rememberable, and put in username and or subscription ID. So both those, whichever one may be applicable, whether it be in a RAR or credit control request, will use that column. That way you have columns upon columns upon columns. Just outlining some more about the dictionary.xml um, or the XML files in slash uh, dictionary. Dictionary is the main file and responsible for calling all the other files. So when you open up that diameter um, directory, you'll see Cisco specific, Ericsson specific, things like that. Dictionary.xml is the one responsible for calling all those others. So you could stand up your own XML file just make sure you add it to the dictionary.xml and put it before all the others.
this outlines what the syntax may look like or has to look like when you have AVP name code. Uh, in this example, I'm just showing how it's the type would be enumerated octet string or UTF-8 and how to associate that. These down here um, don't necessarily have to worry about, you just have to put in there. Yes, no, whatever, it doesn't, it's not gonna affect the dissector. But the ones here in bold are the ones you have to have filled out correctly. All this has to be filled in, but these are the ones that have to be filled out correctly in order to show what it is you're trying to show. It's just a little bit more about the XML files. If you're wanting to change it, a little bit more information on how that is achieved. Okay, that was all on diameter. <clears throat> Our next protocol is GDP. It stands for GPRS Tunneling Protocol. It is UDP based. The, the reliability is built into the protocol itself. That's why we just use UDP. Uh, it's used for GSM, UMTS, and LTE. Um, there are bits that are used in 5G now. And it's used to encapsulate data, not necessarily securely, but it encapsulates data when passing through the EPC. Show you how that's translated. Uh, for LTE, version two was stood up for control plane, and version one, like GSM and UMTS, is still used for user plane. Here in the diagrams I was showing before, so you have GDPC going from ME to S gateway, that's to help stand up the bearer plane, and then you have GDPC going between the S gateway and P gateway. That again is to stand up the user plane. Once that's done, the ENOB that's out here would use GDPU, so B version one, to communicate to the S gateway. S gateway acts as a translator, sends that GDPU to the P gateway, and then the P gateway sends it out the internet most typically. Different GDPC messages are used to manage a tunnel or to set up a tunnel for V1. So uh, GDPC itself doesn't tunnel messages. It has no payload. It simply is used to create the session, modify the session or bearer, so on and so on. So this was at what GDP version two or GDPC looks like. It carries all your tunnel point identifiers. Okay, type of interface, C in the control. Um, this is where DHCP would be handed back to the handset as it carries, uh, not necessarily that, not that IE right there, but um, this is how there is no DHCP exchange with the handset. But using GDPC, we're able to exchange things like DNS, the handset's IP, things like that. Also down here is where you have your user plane. So this would be your version one tunnel. I can't see that, but um, so both, like I was talking about this coming from the ENOB, this is going from the S gateway to P gateway. So ME has to know that um, as it's passed through the S gateway in order to know how these tunnels are transversing the, the packet core. Um, I was using the term TID before. That's how we identify um, the endpoint of GDP. So um, like TCP has segments, SCTP has chunks. We use IEs or individual elements in 
in GDP. And the TID simply identifies the endpoint as the endpoint number for whether you go from the ENOB to the S gateway or S gateway to P gateway. So GDPC is responsible for standing of those endpoints and then communicating those endpoint IDs back to the responsible party. So the ENOB has to know the TID of the S gateway in order to talk to the S gateway. Then the S gateway has to know the TID of the P gateway in order to talk to the P gateway. Like I said before, GDP is um, stateless. Uh, this is over UDP, but the upper layer, upper layer protocols may not be. So in GDP v2, you can diagnose the problem from request to response, but GDP one's a little bit more tricky. So if you have UDP over GDP, you're kind of stuck looking for the application request and response. But if TCP is over UDP, so that's the user traffic going to Google or whatever it may be using TCP, um, Wireshark is able to dig into that and decode it as TCP. And now you can use the TCP dissector and the TCP tools built into Wireshark to help diagnose your problem. This capture here is identifying one of the problems we see in APC that when you're doing a trace, you see the ingress, the translation, and then the egress. So our S gateway and our P gateway may be on the same physical box. So when you're taking a capture, what you're seeing is the packet coming in from the ENOB and then transversing from the S gateway, P gateway internally, and then the P gateway out to the internet. So this is just highlighting that you'll see three packets for one SIN, and that's very typical. Um, but what we have to do is work through the problems of the Wireshark dissector for TCP when it sees a second TCP packet with the same identifier as the one before, it marks it out of order or do back or whatever retransmitted or whatever it may be. That's simply because it's been duplicated in the capture. Okay. The other thing I wanted to show you is that we have a source and dest here, but underneath this packet, you remember that GDP is tunneled. So you have the tunnel IP, and then you have the actual IP that's going out to the internet. Um, this example here should have outlined before where this is GDP going from, let's say in this example, could be the ENOB going to the S gateway. And then you have the user data here that's on top of this tunnel here. So now you have two IPs headers. They're both very important. One is the tunnel information. One is the device going to the internet information. But here, you only have source and dest. So this source and dest is the top most the, what the Wireshark dissector takes the topmost IP header and puts that here. So let's say we want to know about the tunnel information. We want to know that this is going from what ENOB to which S gateway, in addition to the source and dest IP of the device going to the internet. So we can make another co two columns here. What I do is title it tunnel source, type custom, and use ip.source. That gives you the, the IP of the source packet, the source of the packet. And then over here, this is where the magic happens, is make occurrence one. So after Wireshark sees the first occurrence of IP header, it stops. So this will be your outer part of the tunnel. 
and this will be the inner part of the tunnel. And you just repeat this for the de tunnel destination. So tunnel desk would go here, IP desk would go here, and again, you'd have sources one. So now I can see from end to end, going from tunnel source, device source, device destination, tunnel destination. Second thing we need to do is dedupe the packets because we're still stuck with Wireshark uh, seeing triplicates of every packet. There's a, if you have a small capture, there's an easy way to do this. You simply find the most unique thing of one of the three packets. So for me, it's typically I strip off GDP. So as it comes in from the ENOB going to the S gateway, that's GDP. As it goes from S gateway to P gateway, that's GDP. But as it leaves the P gateway going to the internet, GDP is no longer there. So what I'll do, put in my filter is say not GDP. And that'll leave me with every packet that doesn't have a GDP tunnel on it. So that's finding something unique. Now, if you want to look at specific ENOB to go in S gateway, filter on the VLAN. Filter on the, uh, the source uh, IP address of the ENOB, something unique. Okay. At this point, what you do is go to File, Export Specified Packets, and then click the check mark that says Displayed. So now we're only going to export the packets that we have filtered specifically here. Give it a name, save it to your machine, and then open that file. So this is the original file, now turns into this. Okay. So now we can use the TCP dissector and tools that are available to us in, in Wireshark. And it looks much better. We don't have to go through all that out of order stuff, things like that. You have larger captures. I mean, that's the whole point of LTE and 5G <clears throat> is faster data, more data, so on and so on. So you may get gig captures, and that's not uncommon. Um, so what I'm saying here is tools, tools, tools. You don't have to open a capture in order to remove duplicates. You can use edit cap. You can use T-Shark. Um, also, I use CAF info and T-Shark to determine how many streams there are, what are my conversations. Let's say I just want the, a specific conversation or a specific stream going to speedtest.net, a lot of things that we do. Um, I can just throw in a, a filter, just like I would in Wireshark, and say uh, TCP at dot ADDR equals, and then put in my speedtest.net IP or whatever it may be. And now I've taken that gig capture, filter out all the stuff I don't want, and then written it to a new capture here. And then I can open that capture and mess with that. Um, also, if you, you can remove true duplicates with edit cap, this is the command I would use for that. Another thing, if, if you do have a true two gig or so file that you really need to see everything, um, you can divide that into chunks. So use cap info to determine the size, and you can calculate how many chunks you need to divide that up into and use uh, T shark merge cap to, to uh, divide that up. Hey, Mark, you have two questions, or actually three out there. Okay. So do S1AP and NGAP differ significantly? No, they don't. Um, the dissectors that makes it look pretty much the same, at least from what I've seen. Where do I usually capture? The quickest place for me to capture is on the gateways themselves. We use Cisco for the most part across all the companies that I've ever um, Worked for Cisco's pretty popular, so um, 
it's pretty easy to use their capture engine. Now, if that doesn't work, then you're going to have to put taps on either the S gateway or the P gateway. And they have to be hurdy hefty taps because, you know, you've got tens of hundreds of gigs possibly going out of that S gateway or P gateway. Um, I do have samples of these captures built into the actual presentation. So what I have here, um, when you get this, I forget what they call it, Chris, when, it, when the presentation's posted, retrospective? Yeah, uh -huh, that's right. Yeah, so uh, if you open up the presentation, those PCAPs are embedded in the presentation. Another thing, um, after tools, yeah, that was all the questions. Okay. So other than tools, when you're maintaining the network, um, it's pretty hard to remember all the IPs go to which particular host. So my host files come in pretty handy. And I do have a lot of um, profiles, depending on what I'm troubleshooting. I didn't really cover that, but I'm sure Chris did about building profiles. Um, if I'm troubleshooting Volte, I know I, I want to look at particular things, and those rules may may not play well with something I'm troubleshooting in DNS. So I make you know different rules for different things. Um, each of those profiles should have a host name, so I just maintain a parent host and create a a batch file to push that one host file to all my profiles. So I find that important, just thought I'd pass that along. And that's actually all I have. So do we have any other questions here? Um, if we want to talk about 5G real quick, um, diameter for the most part is gone. That's um, now replaced with uh, JSON over HTTP or JSON over HTTP2. When you go to dissect JSON over HTTP, it's, it's straightforward. Wireshark handles that well. But as we were going through uh, 5G and using JSON over HTTP, we were having some issues. So I started looking into it and there had to be a new dissector added or the ability to put JSON over HTTP2. And that's only available in 3.3 after. And 3.3 is in development. So you won't be using a production release if you wanna dissect that. And so is the other question for Discord. I'll have to come back to that. I didn't have that on my machine here. Okay. okay. Do we have any other questions, concerns, comments? Hi, Chris. Not as much. Oh, okay. How large is the typical PCAP file? Uh, it depends on what I'm doing. So if we have massive MIMO out there, um, they were, that's the two gigs I was referring to. Typically, I would say it's about 150 meg for a real problem. Now, if it's Volte, I'm troubleshooting Volte. Those are very small. When I say very small, 25 meg. So I, I like Troubleshooting Volte more than data, but All right.
Chris, so I guess we can give some time back here. Yeah, if there's no other questions or comments for sure. Okay. Uh, we can hang out here for a little bit just in case any other ones Certainly. creep in. Um, well, I covered diameter protocol. Yes, I did. Um, was there something specific we wanted to cover there? Um, why do you reply to that? I think it's Fossil. Uh, Victor, I don't specifically handle X2 AP because that goes from Eno to B, Eno B to Eno B. I see it after the fact that, and it's a, in the form of a pass switch request, but then that comes over S1 AP. So while yes, I do know that it occurs from a me, me perspective, I don't, I don't specifically capture on it. Okay, if that's all the questions, then we could end up a little early. Thanks everybody for coming. And Mark, thanks for the nice presentation. Norris, thank you guys. Have a good weekend. Hope you enjoyed Jerkfest. All right, everyone have a good weekend.